Yu-Gi-Oh! has undergone numerous iterations over the course of its more than 20 years of anime and manga, with each one exploring new subjects and ideas through the lens of a pure-hearted adolescent. From fending off bullies in high school to the very real threat of artificial intelligence wiping out humanity, Yu-Gi-Oh! has taught me that just about anything can be solved with card games. And despite its ever-changing approach, Yu-Gi-Oh! retains its spot as the number one most profitable jump franchise to this day. Aside from Dragon Ball and One Piece, However, most people in the community will have you believe that Yu-Gi-Oh! peaked a long time ago and hasn't come close in the near two decades since. I agree. Don't get me wrong, there have been some excellent story arcs throughout the years, and I'm not saying that any of them are necessarily bad. The pinnacle was simply so high that it will most likely never be reached again. That's why today we're going to discuss how Battle City became the pinnacle of Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. Although Duelist Kingdom is the arc that catapulted Yu-Gi-Oh! into mainstream popularity and made the card game an international sensation, it's the Battle City arc that demanded Yu-Gi-Oh! be taken seriously. Not just as an anime, but as a card game too. Now, Yu-Gi-Oh! wasn't a complete disaster prior to Battle City, it had all of the same themes throughout its entire run, and the card game was already at the center of the story. It's the execution of these ideas that fell flat. You see, Prior to Battle City, the version of the card game that existed within the anime was little more than a confusing mess. In fact, the protagonist of the series is still regarded as a cheater due to the way he played during Duelist Kingdom. Activating Monster Replace during his opponent's turn, fusing Mammoth Graveyard with a spell card, and attacking the moon to destroy the sea. This is number one bullshit. These are all things that Yugi actually does. I suppose it doesn't matter to someone who's never played the game before, and that's who most of the audience was when it first aired, but this created a divide among the players of the real game, those who read the rulebook and those who did not. I should note that this problem didn't exist in Japan because Yu-Gi-Oh! was marketed as for ages 12 and up before it came to the West. But outside of Japan, Yu-Gi-Oh! was marketed towards a much younger age. That's why the anime was so heavily censored by 4Kids. They wanted to make Yu-Gi-Oh! well, 4Kids. The point I'm trying to make here is that a 6-year-old is way less likely to read a rulebook than a 12-year-old. Especially when they could just point to a TV and say, look, he did it, so I can too. So not only did the limited rules in Duelist Kingdom make it impossible to take the anime seriously, it also made it harder for people to play with each other. We are step up and I challenge this guy to a duel. He accepts, and we sit down to play. He opens his hand, you know, he gets his cards, and he's like, well, boy, uh, Goblin Attack Force, go ahead. Well, I have this card. The Blue Eyes White Dragon. <laughs> And he says, you can't just summon a blue eyes white dragon on your first turn. And I looked at him and was like, don't get mad because you're about to lose. He literally took his deck and put it in his bag and he took a rule book out of his bag and he threw it at your boy. He said, get good. What a coward running away from my blue eyes white dragons. <laughs> That obviously didn't stop the game from becoming insanely popular, but it wouldn't have lasted all these years if Konami didn't get it under control, and Battle City played a large role in doing that. And not only did Battle City make sense of the rules, it did so without detracting from the entertainment value. Now that we understand the significance of formalizing the rules, we can turn our attention to the real highlight of Battle City, the narrative. The most underappreciated aspect of Yu-Gi-Oh! has always been its depiction of friendship. Have you ever wondered why Exodia is comprised of five different cards? The design is rooted in mythology, but the reason for exactly five different pieces is to represent each member of Yugi's friend group. This is also why each piece is powerless unless all five are used at the same time. It's a metaphor for friendship. Back in Season 0, when Exodia was first introduced, these five characters, Yugi, Joey, Tristan, Anzu, and Yami, were meant to be viewed as equals. Of course, Yugi was still the main character, and the plot focused on him for a majority of Season 0's duration, but when Yugi's friends were used against him and he had to save them by himself, they realized that they were holding him back. A group is only as powerful as its weakest member, after all. So they went on their own journeys and became stronger on an individual level. This made them feel more like cast members and less like dead weight to be carried by the protagonist, as is often the case with friend groups in shonen anime, especially those of the other Yu-Gi-Oh! series. Now what has any of this got to do with Battle City? Most of that friendship stuff was thrown out in Duelist Kingdom. Kaiba remains a bitter rival, obsessing over his defeat from the first episode, 
Joey returns to Yugi's shadow, and with the exception of a few brief moments, the rest of Yugi's friends are reduced to cheerleading, completely undoing the previous arc. At first glance, Battle City appears to be no different. It's a tournament arc following another tournament arc. Even though the rules have been refined, the game remains the same, and both emphasize Yugi's relationship with Kaiba. In many ways, it resembles a second attempt at the same story arc. However, when you consider how these concepts are applied, Battle City is very much a return to that Season Zero form, while at the same time, it stands out in virtually every way. And we only need to consider one character to illustrate this point. Ever since Yu-Gi-Oh! became a story focused on one specific game rather than games in general, Joey has been used to explain the rules. He's the only character to start with zero game knowledge, and as the show goes on, it's always Joey who makes mistakes and needs to be corrected by Yugi. Clearly he was intended to be a stand-in for the audience. And I know insert characters get a bad rap, which is totally justified, but what if I told you that Joey Wheeler is my favorite character in Yu-Gi-Oh! because of how accurately he represents the audience? That's right. The problem with insert characters is that they're typically very plain in order to feel relatable to as many people as possible. However, Joey Wheeler, especially in the Battle City arc, is only relatable to those who share his ambition. To become a true duelist. What does it mean to be a true duelist? Joey never explains exactly what he means by this, but he does refer to Yugi as a true duelist when discussing his goal. But why him? What sets Yugi apart from the rest of the duelists? His win and loss record is about the same as Kaiba's, so that can't be it. Yugi does have a bit of plot armor due to his friendship, but Joey's a member of that same friend group, so why doesn't that plot armor extend to him? I think it boils down to motivation. How often is it that Yugi plays for the sake of winning? Aside from Duelist Kingdom when he must win in order to rescue his grandpa, Yugi has always played for the love of gaming. And it's this passion that has earned Yugi respect and admiration. How can you beat somebody who enjoys the process more than the outcome? This is the mentality that made Yugi invincible, and it wasn't until Battle City that Joey realized it. Just before the tournament starts, Joey loses his most valuable card, the Red Eyes Black Dragon, and Yugi is tasked with getting it back for him. For Joey, the opponent seemed unbeatable as he won using Exodia, which is the most powerful card in the game. But when Yugi faces that same foe, he not only defeats the guy, but exposes him as a cheater in the process. At this point, it would be easy for Joey to shrug it off as an unwinnable match, as he stood no chance against a cheater in the first place. But Yugi's win is so impressive that instead, Joey has an epiphany. He realizes that as long as he lives in Yugi's shadow, he will never become a true duelist. Thanks to Battle City's anti-rule, one that requires the loser of a duel to give their best card to the winner, Yugi is able to retrieve the Red Eyes. But when he tries to give it to Joey, Joey rejects the offer, says he'll earn it back in the spirit of a true duelist, and goes a separate way. While Joey has Yugi to fall back on, it's easy for him to make mistakes, so he essentially removed a safety net by distancing himself from Yugi. But now that he's alone, the pressure is on. As the arc progresses, Joey strengthens his knowledge of the game, gains confidence in his own abilities through duels, and with each win, he acquires a new card to strengthen his deck. But it isn't until the Mako Tsunami duel that he cracks the code and finally realizes what it means to be a true duelist. Remember, Mako Tsunami was one of Yugi's opponents back in Duelist Kingdom, and when they first met, Joey was barely more than a background character. He was entered in the tournament just like Yugi and Mako, but Yugi coached him through almost all of his duels. Now in Battle City, Joey is good enough to contend with the likes of Weevil Underwood all on his own. Even though he still makes mistakes at times, Joey is so much better than he used to be and he's having so much more fun playing the game that it's clear he's developed a passion for it. So much so that Mako is happy to give up his signature card so he can try to earn it back in a future duel. Now Joey is to Mako what Yugi is to Joey. There's also a duel between Joey and Yugi while Joey is being possessed by Merrick that ends so beautifully it makes Kaiba realize that Yugi's advice was right the whole time. He's stubborn so he doesn't give in right away but this moment went a very long way towards opening up Kaiba to the idea of cooperating with other people. Now there are two reasons why Joey is still widely considered to be a joke of a character. The first is that 4Kids removed the true duelist subplot altogether and gave Joey a new goal of wanting to help Yugi. Lame, I know, but I'll save the 4Kids rant for another time. The other reason is the way Joey's character arc ends. It's not pretty. Joey vs. Merrick. This part is quite frustrating because it undercuts everything that Joey went through leading up to this duel, but let's set the stage. 
Joey has made it to the finals, and if he beats Merrick, he gets to face the winner of Yugi vs Kaiba in the Grand Finals. Obviously, Joey wants to face Yugi so he can try to earn back his red eyes. And much to everyone's surprise, Joey beats Merrick. Except he doesn't, because he dies during his game-winning turn. I know that Yugi is the main character, and Merrick is the main villain, so naturally you would think, okay, obviously Yugi has to be the one to beat him. But Joey winning here would have made perfect sense thematically. In fact, I think Takahashi's original plan was to have Joey win this duel, and then he would go on to face Yugi in the end, and even beat Yugi. Especially since Yugi already defeated Merrick twice earlier in the arc. I suspect that a jump editor convinced Takahashi Sensei that making Joey the one to beat Merrick was a bad idea. Joey wasn't popular enough to save the day, so he was advised against it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Yu-Gi-Oh! is based on a weekly manga that was published in Shonen Jump. Jump editors have a lot of influence because Jump magazines are insanely competitive. Taking the advice of an editor can save a series from being cut altogether. A popular example of this is the tuning exams in Naruto. Orochimaru interrupted them and attacked the third Hokage because a Jump editor told Kishimoto sensei that the exams were taking too long. And I'm not just saying this because I think it would have been better for the story. The plan to make Joey the king of games at the end of Battle City is heavily implied. Yugi and Joey also have an off-screen duel at the end of the arc anyway, and in the Dark Side of Dimensions movie, Joey can be seen holding the Red-Eyes Black Dragon card, implying that Joey was victorious in their off-screen duel. Coincidence? I think not. Couple that with the fact that the final arc was about the Millennium Items and Yami's past, Joey becoming the King of Games would have been the perfect send-off for the card game portion of the series. By the time Battle City ended, the real Yu-Gi-Oh card game had taken on a life of its own, and no longer needed the anime or the manga to survive. Joey becoming the new figure for Duel Monsters represents the audience taking on the legacy of the game. And now that the game is no longer dependent on its source material, this holds true nearly 20 years later. But those are just my thoughts, let me know what you think, thanks for watching.